Welcome to this new video by Simply Learn. Software development is a process of documenting, designing, programming, and testing softwares. In this tech era, there is a boom in the market for software developers. This video will prove a magic potion if you are on a way to grab the opportunity as a software developer. By the end of this video, you will be able to answer the most asked questions in the job interview as a software developer. Let's see what all we are going to cover in this video. We will start this video with the basic introduction to software development and move ahead to know more about coding questions with their expected answers for an interview. We will check on the top asked Java interview questions and top ask Python interview questions again with their expected answers. So before we begin, consider subscribing to our channel and hit the bell icon to never miss any updates from Simply Learn. So let's begin. Hey everyone, I hope you're all doing great. Welcome to Simply Learn's YouTube channel and today we'll be discussing about the coding interview questions. We will begin this video with some conceptual questions about data structures, algorithms and then move on to discussing the coding problems that are most commonly asked to solve in the interviews. These questions will help you summarize every important programming concept and serve as a perfect preparation resource for coding interviews. By the end of this video, I can assure you that you will have a proper understanding of data structure concepts and you will be able to code the most common problems asked in the interviews. So, let's get started with an exciting video on coding interview questions. Before we begin, please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that bell icon to never miss an update from Simply Learn. So, I hope I was clear with the agenda. Now, let's begin with the top 40 coding interview questions that you should know. Programming interview questions are an integral part of an interview for the developer's position. No matter which programming language you master, it is expected that you are familiar with the fundamental concepts of the programming. Coding skills are always the deciding factor in any programming interview. We will discuss the top 40 coding interview questions you should absolutely know how to crack in interviews to get your dream job. So without further ado, let's get started. So as discussed, the first part would be the conceptual interview questions. In that, the first question we have to face is, what is a data structure? So, the answer for this question is, a data structure is a storage format that defines the way the data is stored, organized, and manipulated. Some popular data structures are arrays, trees, and graphs. Moving ahead, we have our next question, that is, what is an array? So basically, all the items that an array stores are of the same data type. It organizes data so that a related set of values can be easily sorted or searched. Now followed by an array, the next question we have is about the linked list. So what is a linked list? It is completely similar to array but there are some basic differences. Like an array, a linked list is a linear data structure in which elements are not necessarily stored in a continuous manner. So linked list is basically a sequence of nodes where each node points to the next node forming a chain like structure. So followed by the linked list, we have the next question which is based on stacks. So what exactly is a stack? Stack is a linear data structure that performs operations in a LIFO order. So in a stack, elements can only be accessed starting from the topmost to the bottom element. So followed by stacks, we have our next question which is, what is a LIFO? So basically LIFO stands for last in, first out. So it is a way of accessing, storing and retrieving data. The data that was stored at the last is extracted at the first. The next one after LIFO is a queue. So what exactly is a queue? Queue is a linear data structure that performs operations in a FIFO order. So basically FIFO is first in, first out. In a queue, the least recently added elements are removed first as opposite to the stack. So up next we have the FIFO. So what exactly is FIFO? FIFO stands for first in, first out. It is a way of accessing, storing and retrieving data. The data that was stored first is extracted first. The next question is about the binary trees. So what exactly are binary trees? A binary tree is an extension of linked list data structure where each node has two children. 
binary tree has two nodes at all the times a left node and a right node so these left and right nodes for the top node are known as children of the top node next we have is recursion so what is recursion recursion refers to a function calling itself based on a terminating condition it uses last and first start functionality and therefore makes use of the stack data structure followed by recursion we have the oops so what is the oops concept oops stands for object oriented programming system a paradigm that provides concepts such as objects classes inheritance polymorphism encapsulation etc so what are the concepts introduced in oops so the following concepts are introduced in oops they are object class inheritance polymorphism abstraction and encapsulation now we will discuss each one of them in a bit more detail so we will begin with object a real world entity having a particular state and a behavior is called as an object it can be defined as an instance of a class so next we have the class a logical entity that defines the blueprint from which an object can be created or instantiated is called as a class so basically class is a blueprint which we use to create an object so followed by classes and objects we have the inheritance a concept that refers to an object acquiring all the properties and behaviors of a parent object is called as inheritance so basically inheritance provides code reusability so followed by inheritance the next important concept we have is the polymorphism so polymorphism is a concept that allows the task to be performed in different ways in java we use method overloading and method overriding to achieve polymorphism followed by polymorphism we have the abstraction a concept that hides the internal details of an application and shows only the functionality is called as abstraction in java we use abstract classes and interface to achieve abstraction the last one is the encapsulation encapsulation is a concept that refers to wrapping of code and data together into a single unit so basically every code we have in the java will have data members and data manipulating methods so encapsulation is a basic concept that brings them together and binds them as a single unit so followed by oops concepts the next important question that we will be facing is about the binary search tree so explain binary search tree a binary search tree stores data in such a way that it can be retrieved very efficiently next the left subtree contains nodes whose keys are less than that of the node's key value the right subtree contains nodes whose keys are greater than or equal to the node's key value followed by that the next question we have is the doubly linked list so what exactly are doubly linked lists the doubly linked list are special type of linked list in which traversal across the data elements can be done in both directions this is made possible by having two links in which one of the node will be connected to the next upcoming node and the other link is connected to the previous node so followed by the doubly linked list the next important question we have is the graph so what exactly is a graph a graph is one type of data structure that contains a set of ordered pairs so these ordered pairs are also referred as edges or arcs and arcs are used to connect nodes where data can be stored or retrieved so followed by this we have our next question that is called as the difference between linear and non linear data structures So the first difference is the linear data structure in which data elements are adjacent to each other and the non-linear data structure is a structure in which each element can connect to two adjacent data elements followed by that the next difference is examples of linear data structure are the arrays linked list stacks and others like queues and examples for non-linear data structures are trees and graphs followed by that the next question is of what is a dq so a dq is a double ended queue and this is a structure in which elements can be inserted or removed from either end followed by that we have our next question which says the difference between the stack and an array so stack follows a lifo pattern it means that the data access follows a sequence in which the last data to be stored is the first element to be extracted Next we have the array arrays on the other hand do not follow a particular order and instead can be accessed by referring the indexed element within the array followed by that the next question is which sorting algorithm is the best there are many types of sorting algorithms like quick sort bubble sort balloon sort radix sort merge sort etc 
and no algorithm can be considered as the best or the fastest because each is designed for a specific type of data structure where it performs the best. And our 19th question is, how does variable declaration affect memory? So the amount of memory can be allocated or reserved depends on the data type being stored in that variable. For example, if a variable is declared to be integer type, then 32 bits of memory storage will be reserved for that variable. So the 28th question is, what are dynamic data structures? So dynamic data structures are the data structures that expand and contract as the program runs. It provides a flexible means of manipulating data because it can adjust according to the size of the data. So these were the conceptual based questions so far we discussed now. Next we will move ahead into the programming interview questions. So at first we have how do you reverse a string in Java? So you can see on my screen we have a code segment that is capable of reversing a string. So basically you declare a string then take the length of that string, loop through the characters of the string and add these characters in the reverse order then print the resultant string. Next we have how do you determine if a string is a palindrome or not? So for that particular question we have a code segment which is capable to reverse the string and check if it is a palindrome or not and accordingly provide the result. So a string is a palindrome when it stays the same on the reversing order of characters in that string. It is achieved by reversing the original string first and then checking if the reverse string is equal to the original string or not. Followed by that we have the 23rd question that says find the number of occurrences of a string character in a string. So the following code segment is capable to find that particular task and to find the number of occurrences of loop through the string and search for that character in every iteration whenever it is found then the count will be updated. Followed by that the 24th question is find if the given two strings are anagrams or not. Two strings are considered as anagrams if they contain similar group of characters in varied sequence. So for finding out if two strings are anagrams or not, we have the code segment on the right part of my screen right now. So basically you declare a boolean value that tells the end of the two strings are anagrams or not. Then first check the length of the both strings if they are same or not. Then if they are not same, then they are not anagrams. If they are same, then they are anagrams. Like they might be a chance of being the two strings as anagrams. And followed by the next step is convert both the strings to character arrays then sort them out. And finally, check the sorted arrays if they are equal or not. If they are equal, then print their anagrams. And if they are not equal, then you should print not anagrams. The next 25th question is, how do you calculate the number of vowels and consonants in a string? So you can see on my screen, I have a code segment, which will be capable of counting vowels and consonants in a string. So loop through the string. So that's the first step. Followed by that, increase the vowel variable by one whenever the character can be found as a vowel using the if condition, otherwise increment the consonant variable. Finally, print the values of both the vowels and consonants count. The next important question we will be facing in the coding interview is how do you get matching elements in an integer array? So for that we have a code segment on my screen right away. Now the steps for that are declare an array, nest a couple of loops and compare the numbers with the other numbers in the array and finally print the matching elements whenever found. So next we have this 27th question that says code bubble sort algorithm. You don't have to code the entire bubble sort algorithm. What you can do is just write the code segment which has a logic for it. So that is currently on my screen right now. So what you basically do is declare an array. So next what you do is nest a couple of loops and compare the numbers in that array and then the array will be sorted in the ascending order by replacing the elements if found in any other order. 28th question is code the insertion sort algorithm. So this is completely similar approach. What we followed for the bubble sort, you just have to write the code segment of logic. So the steps will be first the element in the array is assumed to be sorted. Take the second element and then store it separately in key. Now the first two elements are like sorted. Take the third element and then compare it with the elements in the left of it. The process goes on until the array is sorted. So next we have the 29th question, how do you reverse an array? So you can see on my screen we have a code segment that says how to reverse an array. Loop till the half length of the array. Next we have to replace the numbers corresponding to the indexes from the starting to the end. Followed by that we have the 30th question where we have to find a way to swap two numbers without the third variable. 
So this type of interview question will be asked most number of times to the beginners most frequently. Now the solution for that has been written on my screen right away. You can check out that and the steps to be followed are declare two variables and initialize them with the values. Make B the sum of both the numbers then subtract the sum that is the B from A. So A is now swapped. Lastly subtract A from the sum B. So B is now also swapped. Next we have the 31st question which says print a Fibonacci series using recursion. So for that we have a code segment which can print a Fibonacci series on my screen right now. So the code on my screen can be used to print the Fibonacci series. So basically what are Fibonacci numbers? So the Fibonacci numbers are the numbers in the following integer sequence 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21 and so on. They can be calculated using the mathematical formula used in the Fibonacci recursive function. The next question you'll be facing is how do you find the factorial of an integer? So we have the code segment on my screen which can perform the factorial of an integer operation. So the factorial is a function that multiplies a number by every number below it. For example, factorial of 5 is 5 into 4 into 3 into 2 into 1 which is equal to 120. So recursive function multiplies the number until it reaches 1. The next one is how do you reverse a linked list? So for that we have the code segment on my screen right away. You can please check it out and try it. So if you can find out if it can reverse a linked list or not. So the steps to be done for that are declare a linked list first. Then add elements to that linked list. Apply the descending iterator method to the linked list. And then this should reverse the order of the elements in the linked list. The 34th question is how do you implement a binary search? So for that we have the code segment right on my screen. You can check that out and the steps to be followed are mentioned in the code segment. So the binary search divides the array into half in every iteration step until it finds the element. It works on sorted arrays since it compares the values of adjacent elements and then calculates the middle number. If the value of low becomes greater than high at any point it means the element is not present in the list. So this is how the binary search basically works. Followed by that we have the 35th question which says find the second largest number in the array. So you can see we have a code segment on my screen to find it out. So the steps to be followed are loop through the array. If the value of i is greater than the highest store the value of i in the highest and store the value of highest in the second highest variable. So now let's move ahead to the 36th question. How do you remove all occurrences of a given character from the input string? So we have a simple small code segment on my screen right away. So that code segment can be used to remove all the occurrences of a given character from an input string. So what you can do is use the built in string method that is replace to replace a character with any other character including symbols and white spaces. So followed by that we have our 37th question. So that is showcase inheritance with the help of a program. So we have a small code segment on my screen to showcase the one of the major object oriented programming method that is inheritance. So the class cat inherits the property color from class animal by extending the parent class animal. This way a class cat can have more parent classes if it wishes to inherit their properties as well. So next question that is the 38th question is explain overloading and overriding with the help of a program. So this is a major question which is asked many number of times most frequently for the beginners and sometimes even the experienced candidates cannot escape this question. So first we'll discuss overloading when a class has two or more methods with the same name they are called as overloaded methods. So you can see a code segment on the right side part of my screen right away. So this is an example for overloading. Next we will discuss the overriding. So next we will discuss the overriding. So when a superclass method is also implemented in the child class then it's a clear case of overriding. So on the right side part of my screen you can see a code segment where a child class is extending the base class method which is print name. Now followed by that we have the 39th question. That is check if the given number is prime or not. So you can see a code segment on my screen which determines if the given number is a prime number or not. So the steps to be followed to find if a given number is prime or not are use if statements to check for each condition separately. If the number is 0 or 1 
it cannot be prime. If the number is 2, it is prime. If the number is and finally, the third condition you need to take care of is if the number is indivisible by other numbers, then it is prime. So basically, prime numbers are divisible by one or itself. If any other number is capable to divide the number, then it is not a prime number. Now, the last question in the list is how do you sum all the elements in an array? So for that, we have a code segment right on my screen. Please check it and try to run it. And that's the best way to learn. So the steps to be followed are use the loop to iterate through the array and keep adding the elements in that array. And finally, you'll get the sum of the elements in the array and you can just print this sum at the last. So with that, as you prepare for your upcoming job interview, we hope these coding questions have provided more insight into what types of questions you are likely to be asked. Hey everyone, welcome to Simply Learn's YouTube channel. In terms of programming, Java is a very vast subject. There are high chances that a beginner couldn't always cover every topic for an interview. But what if you can stay on the safer side with the most frequently asked top 10 questions that could always back you up? This video from Simply Learn is about the same. Here, we will discuss the top 10 tricky and most frequently asked Java interview questions. So before we begin, make sure that you have subscribed to our YouTube channel and hit that bell icon to never miss an update from Simply Learn. Now, without further ado, let's get started with the top 10 Java interview questions. So, the top 10th question in our list for today is, what is multi-threading? So, the answer for this question is, multi-threading is a procedure of executing two or more threads simultaneously to perform a certain operation via utilizing the CPU resources to the maximum. Multiple threads do not need separate memory allocation for each one of them. So, by this way, they also save time and memory and run in parallel to each other. So, followed by the 10th question, let us move on to the top 9th question. Does Java include pointers? Now, this question is most frequently asked amongst many interviews for the beginners. So, basically, Java has Java Virtual Machine. So, in that instance, we have some advantages and we might not need point is exactly there. Now, let's look into the answer. So, Java includes Java Virtual Machine, which automatically takes care of memory allocations. So, we do not find any use of pointers in real-time programming in Java. And also, Java has its own garbage collector to free the unused memory as well. Moving on to the next question. What are JDK, JVM and JRE? This is also one of the commonly asked questions. Now, let us discuss the full forms of JDK, JVM and JRE and also what are their functionalities. So, JDK stands for Java Development Kit. So, this is the package which you download for your JVM and JRE together. So, when you download JDK from the official Oracle website, you will be getting the packages of JVM and JRE together and you need to download them and later install them. After installing JDK, you need to set the path for JVM and JRE together. More about that in how to install Java in your Windows system and the link to the video is added in the description box below. Kindly check it. Now moving on to the next one which is JVM. So JVM stands for Java Virtual Machine. So this is the tool that is mainly responsible to convert your program into bytecode. So basically when you run a Java code, the compiler will not directly run your code. First, it will convert the entire program directly into the bytecode and that particular bytecode is run by the compiler. This is the main reason why Java is being platform independent. So moving on to the next one that is JRE. JRE stands for Java Runtime Environment. So Java Runtime Environment is the one which is responsible to provide you all the class libraries and resources for the code execution. Now, moving on to the next question. What is the difference between overloading and overriding? So, by now, I suppose most of you have been facing this question in many interviews. So, the fundamental difference between the overloading and overriding is as follows. When you have two or more methods in the same class with the same name, but different parameters. Parameters in the sense, the number of values you pass to your function call. For example, let us imagine that we have two functions by the name add 
and the function that they will be performing is addition. So one method will be having two variables. For example, add int a int b. So you are sending two values to the function. And another function with the same name that is add will have three values. That is add int x, int y, int z. So here we have different parameters but with the same function call. This type of scenario is called as overloading in Java. Now let us discuss about overriding in Java. When the method signature has same name and same number of parameters in both superclass and child class, then it is called as overriding. Now let us imagine that we have the same method that is add int a int b in both superclass and child class. Now superclass is something which has highest priority. Let us imagine that we have to call a method from child class. So based on the priority of the function call, the JVM might call the method from child class ignoring the superclass. So this is where a method got overridden by the priorities. So this particular act is called as function overriding or method overriding in Java. Now moving forward, we have our next question. What is package in Java? Remember that whenever you write a code in Java, you need a package. So especially when you're working on a high-end IDE like Eclipse, you need to define the package first. It is possible that for some minor programs which you can run on command prompt, you don't need a package, but it is a good habit to use a package. So here the question is, what exactly is a package? A package in Java is a namespace that organizes a set of related classes and interfaces. Conceptually, you can think of packages as being a similar version of your folders in your computer. Now moving on to the next question. Which is the base class of all the exceptions in Java? Or you can also consider this question as which is the library that is responsible for all the exceptions in Java? So the answer for this question is the parent class or the base class for all the exceptions in Java is java.lang library. Now the next question. If I import a package, will the JVM import all the sub packages of the imported package? Now let us imagine that you're working on a package called x and you needed something from a different package. Let us imagine that package is a. So that package has already imported few more packages like b, c and d. So let us imagine again you have a package that you are currently working on that is x and you needed something from a different package that is a. So a has already imported package b, package c and package d. So if you now import package a into package x, then do you have the possibilities that you also import package b, c, d along with a? So the answer for this question is no. When you import a specific package, then the sub packages of the same will not be imported. Here in this scenario, if you wanted to include package A into package X, then you can do it. But the packages that A already included in itself, that is B, C and D, will not be imported into X. However, the developer can manually import the sub packages when finds necessary. So if the developer needs the sub packages that is B, C and D, he can manually import it into X, but they will not come automatically when you import A into X. Now moving ahead into our next question. Does Java has go to statement? So go to is something we can face in some programming languages like C. Now does Java also support that? The answer for this question is no. Java does not have go to statement but it has something similar called labels. So labels are used to change the flow of a program and jump to a specific instruction and label is based on a condition. Now moving ahead into our next question. Is it possible to have a class compiled without main method? Yes. So the main method is always the starting point for compiling for a compiler or an interpreter. But can you compile a complete class without a main method? So this is one of the frequently asked questions. So in Java, it is possible. 
You can execute a Java program without a main method by using static block. Static block in Java is a group of statements that gets executed only once when the class is loaded into the memory by Java class loader. It is also known as static initialization block. Now the last question in our list. Can a dead thread be restarted in Java's multi-threading? So there are chances that sometimes you need to kill a thread. So sometimes after you kill a thread, you feel that that thread might be important for your program. So is it kind of possible to restart it again? The answer for this question is no. Once a thread is terminated in Java, you cannot restart it. Hello and welcome to Python Interview Questions. My name is Richard Kirshner with the Simply Learn team. That's www.simplylearn.com. Get certified, get ahead. Certainly the questions we're going to ask in here are uh, very general with a few specifics towards data science since that's the main direction that Python's going in. And you'd want to expand your uh, questions for your interview depending on the domain that you're using the Python in specifically. Let's dive in and get started with some Python interview questions. Number one, what is the difference between shallow copy and deep copy? And you can see with shallow copy, we have object one, which has child one, child two, child three, and so on. And object two, which has child one, child two, child three. A deep copy creates a different object and populates it with the child objects of the original object. Therefore, changes in the original object is not reflected in the copy. Copy.deep copy creates a deep copy. Shallow copy creates a different object and populates it with the references of the child objects within the original object. Therefore, changes in the original object is reflected in the copy. Copy.copy .copy creates a shallow copy. Uh, and you can look at this, if we make a change to child one, it's only a pointer. So if you make it in object one and a change to child one in object one, it will also make that change in object two. Number two, how is multi-threading achieved in Python? Oh, this is a good one. With multi-processing and multi-threading, this question is actually asking you, do you know the difference between multi-processing and multi-threading and how multi-threading works? Multi-threading usually implies that multiple threads are executed concurrently. The Python global interpreter lock doesn't allow more than one thread to hold the Python interpreter at that particular point of time. So, multi-threading in Python is achieved through context switching. It's very different than multi-processing, which actually opens up multiple processes across multiple threads. So multi-threading. Discuss the Django architecture. So the Django architecture, and the first thing to know is that the um, Django is a web service, way to build your web pages, basically. And so when you look at the architecture, you can see here we have a nice model drawn out where the user initiates the Django, which initiates the URL, which initiates the view, what they're going to view, and you have your model and your template. So the model of data, whatever data model you're pulling, goes into the template and then goes back up the pipeline to the user. And the important thing to note is there's a template, the front end of the web page. This is what they're going to see. There's the model, the back end where the data is stored. So you can keep the template and the looks and everything looks the same, but you can swap out the underlying uh, information that goes into that template. Then you have your view, which interacts with the model and template and maps it to the URL. And then the Django serves the page to the user. So your Django grabs it and says, okay, thank you for the URL and here you go, user. What advantage does NumPy Array have over nested list? So NumPy is a module you import, almost always see NumPy, import NumPy as NP. Uh, NumPy is written in C, such that all its complexities are backed into a simple to use module. Lists, on the other hand, are dynamically typed. Therefore, Python must check the data type of each element every time it uses it. This makes NumPy arrays much faster than lists. I would also add in that NumPy has a lot of additional functionality that you don't have in list. So there's a lot of things you can automate in the NumPy. Quick flip over to our Jupyter Notebook. Any IDE will work. If you're going to do a set of interview questions, taking a quick look at code is always important. We have our import NumPy as NP. We'll go ahead and import time. Here's our list, list sub for I in range of 100. And what we're doing is we're going to time it. So we're going to create a list. Then we're going to create a NumPy zeros array. And you can see here, look how quick you can create this NumPy zeros array. Here we are appending one zero at a time for a regular 
Python list, and here we are with NumPy. They're all zeros, and they're all of type integer. I believe it's either float or integer on this. I'd have to actually do a type on it. And then, so if we take in and we create a TL1 time equals time, and then we do for i in range of 100, for j in range of 100, L of i j equals L of i j plus 5. So we're just doing a simple calculation on our array and subarrays. This is an array of arrays. And we'll do the same thing with TL2, TL2 time dot time, TL1 equals, so here we have our final time on that. And then we'll do this with an array, array op, and this is what I really love, A equals A plus 10, and then you can just print it right out. So you can see right here with a numpy array, we're doing the same thing. If I run this, our time is significantly different. Here we have 0.09 and 0.003. Uh, so you can see that the time drops significantly when you're running this on a numpy array versus a list array. Also important to note, these times aren't going to be, uh, they'll change each time I run it depending on what I have running in the background. So there we go. Number five, what is pickling and unpickling? It amazes me how many times I pickle and unpickle something. Converting a Python object hierarchy to a byte stream is called pickling. Pickling is also referred to as serialization. Unpickling, converting a byte stream to a Python object hierarchy is also called unpickling. Unpickling is also referred to as deserialization. So if you just created a neural network model, you can now save that model to your hard drive, pickle it, and then you can unpickle it to bring it back into another software program or to use at a later time. How is memory managed in Python? Number six. Python has a private heap space where it stores all the objects. The Python memory manager manages various aspects of this heap, like sharing, caching, segmentation, and allocation. The user has no control over the heap. Only the Python interpreter has the access. You have a nice little diagram here. Here's your program. There's your interpreter. We have our heap, memory management on the garbage collector going off of there. Number seven, are arguments in Python passed by value or by reference? Arguments are passed in Python by reference. This means that any change made within a function is reflected on the original object. So you can see here def function of L, L of 0 equals 3, L equals 1, 2, 3, 4, function L, print L, and you're going to get 3, 2, 3, 4, because we passed L in there, so it's a pointer. Here we have def function L, L equals 3, 2, 3, 4, L equals 1, 2, 3, 4, function of L, print L. Because in this function, I have assigned, instead of operating on a piece of L, the list, I've consigned a whole new value to that list, or L, it then at that point will create a new object. So if I make changes to the object, it's going to change it in the outside the definition. If I use a variable and I assign it a completely new value, like L equals 3, 2, 3, 4, that will not show up when you're outside the function. Number eight. How would you generate random numbers in Python? To generate no random numbers in Python, you must first import the random module. The random function generates a random float value between 0 and 1. The random range function generates a random number within a given range. And you can see here, 1 is the lower end, 10 is the upper end, and step 2. So it would be 1, 3, 5, and so on, as far as the options in the random generation. Number 9, what does the double forward slash operator do? In Python, the forward slash operator performs division and returns the quotient in float. For example, 5 over 2 returns 2.5. To do a double forward slash operator, on the other hand, returns the quotient in integer. For example, 5 double slash returns 2. 5 divided by 2 and you drop the 0.5. Number 10, what does the is operator do? The is operator compares the ID of the two objects. And you can see in here where list1 equals brackets around 1, 2, 3. List1 equals list2 equals true. And you have the double equals in Python, of course. And you can do list1 is list2, where list2 equals 1, 2, 3 is false. List2 is not the brackets 1, 2, 3. It equals it, but it's not the brackets. And if we do list3 equals list1, then list1 is list3 equals true. Number 11, what is the purpose of pass statement? The pass statement is used when there's a syntactic, but not an operational requirement. For example, the program below prints a string ignoring the spaces. And so here we have variable equals simply learn. We've added two spaces in it for i in variable. So it goes through each i. If i equals space, do nothing. Else, print i, and then we'll have the end equals 
bracket bracket and they'll print out simply learn now of course you would probably write this if i does not equal blank space print but this would be another way you could do that if you need a placeholder for that first logical set or that first area and you can also do a function like this you could do function uh, whatever your def function name brackets colon pass so it goes into the function and does nothing but it's a placeholder Number 12, how will you check all the characters in a string are alphanumeric? Python has an inbuilt method, isAllNumber, which returns true if all characters in the string are alphanumeric. And so you can see here, A, B, C, D, 1, 2, 3, is all number, output equals true. And the second line, A, B, C, D, the at symbol, 1, 2, 3, the pound symbol, is all num, output equals false. So really you just want to know about is all num, all numerical, alphanumerical. Number 12, how will you check if all characters in a string are alphanumeric? So here we go, if you know is all number, which returns that the characters in the string are alphanumeric, one can also use regex instead. And so we have Boolean re match. What's important about this is to note your capital A dash to capital Z, A lowercase to dash to Z, zero to nine, means that that array includes all of those, the way they have it written out, plus a dollar sign, and then we have what we're comparing it to, the string we're comparing to, the A, B, C, D, 1, 2, 3. And so we can do an re.match, and if it matches, if all these things, if all the different entities in that array matches the first one, we get an output true, and if not, an output false. Number 13, how will you merge elements in a sequence? Sequence. There are three types of sequences in Python. There's lists, tuples, and strings. Python, of course, makes this easy. If we have a list 1 and list 2, and list 1 is uh, square brackets 1, 2, 3, list 2 is 4, 5, and 6, we can simply do list 1 plus list 2, and our output is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. If we have tuples, your tuple is the curved brackets designates it, and again, just add them together. Same thing with strings. We have simply learn S1 plus S2 equals simply learn. Number 14, how will you remove all leading white space in a string? Python provides the inbuilt function lstrip to remove all leading access from a string. And you can see here, space, 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 python dot lstrip, leading strip, python. And you can also do strip, which releases leading and ending. And of course, there's also the ending set. Number 15, how will you replace all occurrences of a substring with a new string? The replace function can be used with strings for replacing a substring with a given string. Syntax, string.replace, old, comma, new, comma, count. Replace returns a new string without modifying the original string. Hey John, how are you John? Question mark. Replace John with capital J-O-H-N, one. And then you can see right here, hey John, how are you? And since we designated it with the one, just says we're only going to replace one of these. 16. What is the difference between del and remove brackets on lists? Del for delete. Del removes all elements of a list within a given range. Syntax. Del list start to end. Remove. Remove brackets removes the first occurrence of a particular character. Syntax list remove element. And we see a nice example over here. If we uh, delete the list 1 to 3, it will delete the first, in this case, B, 1, 2. It doesn't do 3. Remember that. 1, 2. So we will delete B and C and you end up with a D. Where if we do remove B from the list and we have an A, B, B, D, it's only going to remove the first B. Number 17. How to display the contents of text file in reverse order. Open the file using the open function. Store the contents of the file into a list, reverse the contents of the list, run a for loop to iterate through the list. Number 18. Differential between append and extend. Append adds an element to the end of the list. You can see right here we have a list 1, 2, 3, 4, and we append 4, and we end up with an output 1, 2, 3, 4. And extend adds an element from an iterable to the end of the list. And we have here list equals 1, 2, 3, list.extend456. Output is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So if you want to append an array to the end of another array, you want to use the extend. Number 19, what's the output of the below code? Justify your answer. This is a great interview question because these are the kind of things that come up when you're proofing code. Def add to list value and list. So we have value in and a list in, or list equals an empty, in this case an empty list. List.append value return list. List1 equals add to list1. List2 equals add to list123, empty bracket. List3 equals add to list A. 
and then we want to print them. List 1 equals, and you can see the formatting, we have our placeholder, list 1, list 2, and list 3. So when it prints list 1, we get 1, comma, A. And what you want to notice here is that list 1 and list 3 are equal. Why are they equal? Well, when we passed the information to the add to list, we passed value without passing the list equals brackets, without passing a second value. What this means is that list, as we have it, if you don't have a list, it'll start off with empty list, which we append the one to. The second one, list two, we appended a value to an empty list. So it's only going to be one, two, three. It doesn't matter what the list was before, we've already assigned an empty list. And then list three, here's the tricky one. We're adding A to the list, but because we didn't designate the list, list is a shared value. In other words, it doesn't reset it. And we end up with list 1 equals list 3, 1 comma A. Default list is created only once during the function and not during its call. Number 20, what is the difference between a list and a tuple? Lists are mutable while tuples are immutable. And you can see an example down here where I have list equals 1, 2, 3. Square brackets denote it's a list. List of 2 equals 4 and I print it out and I now have 1, 2, 4. If I do the same thing with the tuple, I get an error because you can't change the tuple 1, 2, 3 into 1, 2, 4. You have to completely reassign tuple to a new value. What is docstring in Python? Docstrings are used in providing documentation to various Python modules, classes, functions, and methods. And so you can see here we have def for a function, add a, b, and this is a doc string. We have the um, triple brackets on there. You can add carriage return in that so that you can go multiple lines. And it says this function adds two numbers. And then sum a, b returns sum. And so we have down here two different ways of accessing this function. Output, accessing doc string method one, this function adds two numbers. Accessing doc string method two, help on function add in model main. This function adds two numbers. And so you can see the code down here has two very different end values. The second one is basically a help menu. There's our help menu. Number 22, how do you use print without the new line? The solution to this depends on the Python version you are using. In Python version 2, you can do print hi and then you add a comma afterwards. Print how are you and you have hi, how are you? In version 3, print hi, comma, end equals, and it add, it'll add a space on the end there. You can put different characters in there, but you just want to put a space to put a space on the end. Print how are you, and now we get hi, how are you? Number 23, how do you use the split function in Python? The split function splits a string into a number of strings based on a specific delimiter. So we have string, split, delimiter, comma, max, the maximum number of splits. The character based on which the string is to split by default is space. So here we have an example. We have a variable red, blue, green, orange, and we want to split it by commas, and we only want to do the first two. So if we print the list now, you'll find it has red, blue, and only split it, split it the first two times, and it gets to the third one and just groups them all together, green and orange. If you leave the two off, it'll split the whole thing. Number 24, is Python object-oriented or functional programming? Python follows object-oriented paradigm. And you should really know in depth what they mean by object-oriented paradigm if you're doing any interview uh, for scripting languages. Python allows the creation of objects and is manipulation through specific methods. It supports most of the features of OOPS, which as inheritance on a polymorphism. So you have an object and you can inherit all the traits of that object and then add new traits in or alter some of those traits. That's what object-oriented means. Python follows functional programming paradigm. Functions may be used as first class object. Python supports lambda functions, which are characteristic of functional paradigm. So you can set a variable to a function as opposed to setting it to an object. Number 25, write a function prototype that takes variable number of arguments. Here we have def function name list. So we could have, in this case, whatever the list is, def function, the asterisk denotes that so we're going to take multiple arguments of a variable, and then we can do for i in var, print i. So if you send function of 1, you'll end up with a one function 1, 2, 5, 6. It'll actually print those out one at a time. The first one just prints out a 1 because it only sent one variable. The second one will print 1, another line 25, another line 6. Number 26, what is asterisk args and asterisk quarks? 
args used in function prototype to accept varying number of arguments. It's an iterable object, def function args. And you can imagine it's just a basic list. So if I send add the numbers a comma b or a comma b comma c, it doesn't really matter. It will have that number of objects in it, whatever I send to it. And there's other uses for it, but that, that's very basic. Quarks I can actually tell it what I want to send. So used in a function prototype and to accept varying number of keyworded arguments. It's in both our iterable objects, so you can go through them one at a time. And the def function chords, you can now set like color equals red, units equal two. So you'll see that, especially in machine learning, there's a lot of like they'll have uh, inline equals true, that kind of thing. Number 27. In Python, functions are first class objects. What do you understand from this? This means I could return a function. It could be one from another function. I could create a function and treat it just like an object. I can assign it to a variable. I can pass them as arguments to other functions. Number 28. What is the output of print name underscore underscore name? Justify your answer. The double underscore name double underscore is a special variable that holds the name of the current module. Program execution starts from main or a code with zero indentation. Thus, double underscore name double underscore name has a value double underscore main double underscore in the above case. If the file is imported from another module, then double underscore name underscore double underscore holds the name of this module. Number 29, what is a numpy array? And we briefly touched numpy array compared to a list early in processing speed. Now let's go ahead and look at some of the more specifics. A numpy array is a grid of values, all of the same type. So if they're either all float, all integer, all string, and is indexed by a tuple of non-negative integers. The number of dimensions is the rank of the array. And the shape of an array is a tuple of integers giving the size of the array along each dimension. Number 30, what is the difference between matrices and arrays? A matrix comes from linear algebra and is a two-dimensional representation of data. It comes with a powerful set of mathematical operations that allow you to manipulate the data in interesting ways. Now, arrays, an array is a sequence of objects of similar data type. An array within another array forms a matrix. Like we said here, two-dimensional. So if you have an array of three by four, that would be a matrix. Number 31, how to get indexes of n maximum values in a numpy array. Of course, the first thing to do is to import your numpy as np. You don't necessarily have to use np, but that is the most standard use of numpy. We create our array equals an np.array of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then if we want to get our indexes of n maximum values in a numpy array, we can do one way to do it is to take our array, sort it, then do minus n colon. That means we're going to do, once you've sorted it, you can do minus n. n would equal then the number of indices, so it's not the actual letter n, colon. And really, this is about understanding this notation, that we can sort it. So it goes from lowest to biggest, and then we can get the top values for n indexes. And then we have our final set of brackets with the minus one on there. Number 32, how would you obtain the resulting set from the train set and the test set from below? And let's go ahead and look at the two different variables. We have train set equals an array of one, two, three. Test set equals a numpy array of arrays. We have zero, one, two, one, two, three. What's important here is that one, it's a numpy. So that leaves A out. And then we're stuck with three other options. And I'm going to say that D is out, none of these. And let's look at uh, np.concatenate versus np.vstack. Concatenate would put one set after the other. So you would end up with probably give you an error because one set is one, two, three. And then we're going to concatenate array zero, one, two, and one, array one, two, three, the array of arrays onto the end of that. What we really want to do is stack. And by the way, as you can actually switch, there's variables you can put into concatenate, obviously, that can change this. So you could use the concatenate with a lot of fudging around. But really what we're looking for is V stack. V stands for vertical versus the H stack, which is horizontal. And if we do a V stack, we can simply do train set, comma, test set, and stack them together. And so we have C, resulting set equals np.vstack. 
train stack test set. Both option A and B would do horizontal stacking, but we would like to have the vertical stacking option. She does this. Again, you could add the axes in and use the concatenate to stack it the correct way. Number 33, how would you import a decision tree classifier in sklearn? We have sklearn.decisiontree import decision tree classifier from sklearn ensemble import decision tree classifier. And we look at these and they're all import decision tree classifier. That actually have last part happens to be correct and it's really just a vocabulary knowing where is the decision tree classifier stored what module is that a part of and it is of course part of the sklearn.tree number c number 34 you have uploaded the data set in csv format on google spreadsheet and shared it publicly how can you access this in python what's important here is to know that we can read stuff with pandas so we don't show it here but you can there's actually a number of ways to do this what's important here is to know a couple things one we have our link generated from the google docs and spreadsheets and then we can do a string io dot string io request get link dot content so there's our source and then finally we know that pandas can read a csv there's obviously many ways to read a csv but data equals pd dot read underscore csv source number 35 what is the difference between the two data series given below below we have df name and df location colon comma brackets around asterisks around name comma where and then we have df equals pd data frame a a b b x x u u comma 21 16 50 33 columns equal name and age. So let's take a look and see what they're looking at. We have just glancing at the questions they want to know is it the original data frame or is it the copy of the data frame and you can see here that one is view of the original data frame and two is a copy of the original data frame. Two is a view of the original data frame and one is a copy of the original data frame. Both are copies, both are views. And if you're working with pandas, you know that unless you specifically in certain things tell it to do it inline, and a lot of functions don't allow you, that you're always taking a slice and it is always a copy. So C, both are copies of the original data frame. Number 36, you get the following error while trying to read a file, temp.csv using pandas. Which of the following could correct it? So here's our error, trace back most recent call last, file input, line one in module, unicode in code error ascii codex can't encode character Ooh, i hate it when that one comes up and we have four different entries we'll go ahead and just pretend that d doesn't exist unless we really can't fit it into one of the other answers and the first one is pd read csv has our file compression equals gzip well gzip is just an unzipping and you actually get a zip error on there the second one is dialect equals string again not an encoding or coding setup and then we have encoding equals UTF-8. Well, that would be the encoding error, switching it from the character code. There's UTF-8, there is Unicode. That's the most common two that it goes between. So really this is about understanding the difference between a UTF-8 coding and a Unicode and the error that comes up quite regularly with that. Number C, encoding should be UTF-8. Number 37, how to set a line width in a plot given below. So looking at this, we have import matplotlibrary, pyplot, is PLT and you should know your way around this how to do a plot in there PLT dot plot one two three four plot equals show and so this is a little bit of a vocabulary test the vocabulary is it width equals three line width equals three LW equals three or something else and the vocabulary word that we're looking for is LW equals three which stands for line width in PyPlot library PyPlot number 38 how would you reset the index of a data frame to a given list so this is a vocabulary challenge and understanding what re-indexing is. Re-indexing, as we have the different values here, we have the first one, which is reset the index. Well, we're not really resetting the index. Re-index number B means we are double checking our indexes to the column and to the main index. And so the values match correctly. Where re-index like now brings in a new index outside of our data frame to a given list. So this is coming from external and thus the 
vocabulary word like is our key word that it's external and we have a data friend to a given list. Number 39, how can you copy objects in Python? The functions used to copy objects in Python, we have copy copy for shallow copying and copy deep copying for deep copy. Number 40, what is the difference between range and X range functions in Python? Well, this is a good one. We have matrices and arrays. With a matrix, the range returns a Python list object. X range returns an X range object. And with arrays, an X range returns an X range object. X range creates values as you need them through yielding. The key here is that X range returns the values as you need them. So it actually processes it post. Like if you have for X or for a variable in X range, it is processing them as you need them, zero to nine. It doesn't create an array zero to nine. It just hands you zero, then one, two, three, four, one at a time. Number 41, how can you check whether a pandas data frame is empty? empty or not. The tribute df.empty is used to check whether a pandas data frame is empty or not. And so you can simply create a, we have down here import our pandas as pd. We create our pandas data frame equal to an empty array and is df.empty comes out as true. One of the catches you got to remember with these vocabularies is with empty along with some other pandas setup, whether you need the brackets or not at the end. Number 42. Write the code to sort an array in NumPy by the n minus one column. This can be achieved using argsort function. Let us take an array x, then to sort the n minus one column, the code will be x to x to colon n minus two dot args sort. So let's see what that code looks like. We import NumPy as NP. We'll create our array, um, our NumPy array, which is uh, 1, 2, 3, 0, 5, 2, 2, 3, 4. So we have three different entities with three different columns in there. And we go x of x. And so we take x of um, all the rows, first entity, or in this case it's actually the second one because it's 0, 1, 2, dot arg sort. So that would be the second entity or minus 2 would also be the same. You could also do instead of 1, you could also do minus 2 there instead of the 1. Arg sort, and then we get an output of the array 1, 2, 3, 0, 5, 2, 2, 3, 4. Number 43, how to create a series from a list, numpy array, and dictionary. So we'll go ahead and input, import our numpy, our pandas, and have my list. And you can see here we have my list equals list of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, over all the way through. So my list now makes a list of that. For array, we have np.a range to 26. My dictionary will create a dictionary with a zip my list my arguments. So I'll just use uh, the numpy array we just created with my array to go into um, the dictionary. And the solution is simple with the pd.series my list, pd.series my array, pd.series my dictionary. So it's all about knowing the dot capital S E R I E S. Don't forget that capitalization. Number 44. How to get the items not common to both Series A and Series B. And you can see here we have, uh, instead of Series A and B, we have Series 1 and 2. And uh, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. The solution is we take a panda series. We have a Series U equals a panda series, NP union, one dimension, Series 1, Series 2. So we can now make a union of them. We now have Series 1 panda series with an intersection. And then we can remove one from the other. Series U is series U dot is in series one. So if the union is not in the intersection, then you know it's a unique value. A little bit of logic going on there and playing with three different terms to get the answer we want. 45. How to keep only the top two most frequent values as it is and replace everything else as other in a series. So again, we're working with pandas, because if you're talking series and data frames, that means we're working with pandas. Uh, so we're going to import pandas as pd. We'll go ahead and create our pandas series. We're going to do that by creating a numpy random random state, 100, so 100 in the numpy one. And then we have our pandas series. You can see here we're uh, random integer, numpy random dot random integer, uh, 1 comma 5 by 12. And so the solution for this is we go ahead and, and we've created a pd dot remember the capital s series solution we're going to print the top two frequencies and that is our series dot value counts and then we take series values count dot index of up to two so we're going to take everything up to two and then we'll do the series is in so if it's not in the first two then it's going to equal other 
And this would be something you'd want to write down on paper. If you're, if it looks confusing, take a moment, pause the video, write this down, and see if you can figure out how the logic came together and try to throw yourself a couple other little logic puzzles like this. Number 46, how to find the positions of numbers that are multiples of three from a series. And in here, we're actually going to use a numpy to solve it. The first part, series, lets you know it's going to be a panda series. And if we come down here, we have np.arg where, so this is a vocabulary question, series with, remember the percentile 3 is the remainder, so if the remainder equals 0, then we're going to generate that string where the object divided by 3 equals 0 has no remainder, so then we know it's a multiple of 3. Number 47, how to compute the Euclidean distance between two series. And this one's really cool because we have our panda series, uh, P and Q. And what I like about this one is they give us two solutions you can go with. And really, you should kind of know both. The first one would be, yes, you know what the Euclidean distance is. And that is we can take the first series minus the second series squared and then sum them up, and then we do the square root, which is the same as taking the power to 0.5. Doing the power to 0.5 is easier than doing the square root. So a lot of times you'll see that as a switch, but you could have also done the square root and used the math in there. So there's solution one. You should know your Euclidean distance. And then solution two is the numpy solution. So we have np linalg.norm. That's how we're going to compute our Euclidean distance. P minus Q. Very elegant and very straightforward and easy to compute. Number 48, how to reverse the rows of data frame. So here we have our data frame. We're going to create a numpy array by 25, reshape it 5 minus 1. And this creates a 25 by 25 uh, data frame. And so our solution is to do the DFI location. And this is just understanding how steps work. The steps, you have your colon, colon, minus 1. So we're taking all the rows, all the columns, minus 1. So we're stepping minus 1 going the reverse direction. And then we're just going to use across all the different columns on there. Let me say that again. The first colon is going to be your row. Starting row, stopping row, step minus 1. That's all this is about is that step minus 1, comma, and then all the columns. 49. If you split your data into train test splits, is it possible to overfit your model? And the answer is yes, is definitely possible. One common beginner mistake is retuning a model or training new models with different parameters after seeing its performance on the test set. My favorite example of this is you have your um, script put together and you keep hitting the rerun button until you get the answer you want, not taking the answer it first gave you or running it over an array and recording all the answers to see how they vary. Number 50, which Python library is built on top of Matplotlibrary and Pandas to ease data plotting? The answer to this is Seaborn. Seaborn is a data visualization library in Python that provides a high level interface for drawing statistical information and informative graphs. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.